councillors, chief officers, ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding to receive the worshipful, the Mayor of Knowsley, Councillor Frank Walsh. Colleagues, please be seated. <coughs> Colleagues, welcome to this meeting and welcome to everyone in the public gallery. Can I remind everyone that all mobile phones should be turned to silence <coughs> for the duration of this meeting and can I ask all members to ensure that they use the microphones. Please note that as usual, the council will be filming and recording this meeting. This will include people sitting in the public gallery. A copy of the film will be uploaded to the Nosley Council YouTube site in due course following this meeting. Can I also refer everyone to the order paper that has been placed in front of them on each seat in the public gallery. Colleagues, before we move to the first item of business, I feel I must reference the horrendous events across the country since our last full council meeting. Most recently, the fire in London and a number of terrorist incidents, including the atrocity at the Manchester Arena, which claimed the life of a young Halewood resident, Megan Hurley, whose funeral takes place this Friday. In addition, I am very sad to announce the death last week of our colleague, former councillor, Sammy Lee. Can I therefore ask you all to join me in a minute's silence as a sign of respect. Thank you, colleagues. <laughs> Item number one, are the minutes agreed? <coughs> Item number two, declarations of interest. Thank you, Mr. Murder. There are a number of interests being declared, and these will all be recorded in the minutes. Thank you. Item number three, mail communications. Can you please note these engagements which have already taken place? Item 3B, announcements. Can I invite Councillor Andy Moorhead to say a few words? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Someone says to me before, someone's definitely going to steal your horse before he starts and it's happened. Anyway, I, I, on the 19th of May 2017, I attended a festival for adult learning events in the Museum of Liverpool at Man Island. The event is organised annually, annually by Mersey Cell and UniLearn and celebrates adult learning from across the city region. At that event, on behalf of the council, I signed the CUC Apprenticeship Charter. It's a giant week. And as you can see, I can't sign on the vertical. Our local trade union colleagues from Unison and United and Team B, some of which are at the back, also signed the charter. A copy of the signing commitment is here 
I said, I'm council meeting. He's also said, the charter commits the council to ensure that all apprentices are treated fairly and properly within the workplace and covers areas such as pay, training, health and safety and personal development for all our apprentices. Colleagues will be aware that the council already pays all of its apprentices the real living wage. I was proud to sign the charter. It's yet another example of the council investing in our workplace, particularly in our young people. It also demonstrates our long-standing and continued commitment to working in part partnership with our trade union colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Can I invite Councillor Graham Morgan to say a few words? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Colleagues, you know how much hard work we have put into shaping our vision and plans to regenerate our town centres. But it's just a pity that the opposition decided to vote and campaign against the regeneration of Prescott Town Centre. Well, we're not the only ones within the Labour group who believe we have an outstanding master plan. Colleagues, I am delighted to announce that our Prescott Town Centre Master Plan scooped the 2017 National Award for Master Planning at last week's Planning Awards in London. The national recognition is brilliant news for Prescott residents and it shows that this Labour-run council is developing the best regeneration ideas for our town centres. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. <coughs> Item number four, public question time. No public questions have been received. Item number five, partner presentation, Valair Board. Mr Kevin Schofield, would you like to address the Council with your presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Okay, um, <coughs> what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes or so is just give you a quick brief overview of how things have gone on in Malay over the last 15 to 18 months. So, <coughs> let's rewind back to 18 months while we created Malay. First of all, there was an excess of 300,000 tax savings from day one. The new model was aimed at protecting facilities, services, jobs, as the then the do nothing option wasn't an option. The main within the council would probably recommend <coughs> a further reduction in services and potential job losses. The company was established in, 2000, in December 2015 and commenced trading in April 2016. All the existing staff retained the terms and conditions at the point of transfer and that included access to the local government pension scheme. In terms of how cheaper transfers go, it was a very successful transfer. There was no staffing issues at all. I think that was attributable to the meaningful and honest engagement we had with staff and trade unions throughout the journey, not just at the point of the decision. With regards to the organisation and the governance of Valair, Valair is a limited company by guarantee, a not-for-profit organisation, meaning all the profits are reinvested back into the business. It operates independently with the council, although it's 100% owned by the council, which means the council asserts its influence and control via the board. And in the memorandums and articles for the company, the council representatives will always have the majority vote. We have the same organisational and financial rigour as any council department. Indeed, most of the policies and procedures mirror that of the council. In fact, most are adopted from the council. It's independently audited on an annual basis, and we have a legal requirement to register our end of year accounts with Companies House and for us that's this September. And obviously there's continued engagement and support between Wallet and the Council, as most of the service level agreements we have are with other council departments. So, post transfer, what was our sort of first focus over the initial few months? Our well, first one was rebranding introducing the LA to its customers, but whilst maintaining business continuity. What we agreed, rather than have a big brass band and say, here we are, we've arrived, we agreed a more subtle approach in terms of the transformation from 
Council to relay it. One of the key things was ensuring the back office functions and systems and processes, both new and old, were working and were fit for purpose. And more importantly, we had financial stability, cash flow being the lifeblood of any business organisation, that being our ability to meet our liabilities and not least to pay the workforce. This meant us having to be more efficient in generating income and bringing income in, and also chasing debt. Another key focus was developing a more robust marketing strategy, focused on growth, increased penetration rates, increased sales, improved retention rates, and converting pay-to-go casual customers into lifelong members. And of course, continued staff and customer engagement, which was quite important throughout the whole process. Just to share with you a story there, after the first week of transfer, and this is a true story, we had a customer <coughs> book to the member staff and say, now then, who's this French company that's just taken over our leisure centres? <laughs> and that was a true story. Another important aspect was upskilling and the development of staff in the new world world. It was paramount importance and a key priority for us. So, moving on from the initial few months, the results of this with a stronger recognised brand, not just locally, but regionally and nationally. There's been an awful lot of press in the industry about Valet, and there's been an awful lot of interest, both from public and private sector, in our journey so far. Making sure systems and processes are working as they should, a settled cash flow, money in the bank, the ability to pay our bills, and customers engaged and comfortable with the transition acknowledging we hadn't been invaded by the French. <laughs> a more robust and focused marketing strategy, intrinsically linked to a more robust performance framework, resulting in staff being more focused, engaged and knowledgeable. And also quicker decision making. The ability for us in the company to react quicker to different circumstances. We've also over the last 12 months continued to invest heavily across the estate there's been £200,000 worth in excess of backlog repairs and maintenance, which was agreed post or pre transfer before we transferred over that the council agreed to undertake. We've had a new 3G pitch at both Prescott and Kirby, new spin, spike, new spin bikes at Stockbridge, a new sauna at Kirby Leisure Centre, new pool side steam and sauna at Hayward Leisure Centre, a new fully refurbished gym at Kirby Leisure Centre. And all sites have been or continue to be refreshed so they walk and feel warm and inviting. And we've also went into new par partnership arrangements with Prescott Cables. So their ground is now called Malay Park. So in our inaugural year, what did all our hard work and investments achieve? First thing, we achieved all our first year's finance and performance targets. We had increased growth and participation, improved culture and environment, although there's still much work to do around that, improved staff morale, reduced sickness rates from nine days to 7.5 days for full-time employees. We've got better and increased <coughs> customer and community engagement. We have better market awareness and intelligence across all levels of staff, not just the senior management team on the board. And we're achieving better value for money which has enabled us to reduce our cost base and to invest funds elsewhere in the business. And to put those achievements into some form of measurements for those of us who like stats, you can see for yourself there, we've had quite a successful and strong year. A 2% increase in participation, 15% increase in swimming lessons, 10% in memberships, 14% increased passports to leisure, 10% increase in under 16s, 5% increase in over the 60s, and 2% increase in female visits, and a 44% increase in employee visits, which suggests the concessionary usage scheme is working well. We had a huge uptake over the last 12 months with that one. Just to share with you some other interesting <coughs> stats in terms of gender usage, it's fairly evenly split between 50 50, 48% women, 52% male, 73% of our users are 25 plus. And the lowest user groups are between 0 and 4 years old and 11 to 15 years old, which suggests, I think, for Valet and other partners within the council, 
there's a lot of efforts these days given that child obesity rates are increasing across the border. In terms of our latest customer <coughs> satisfaction results, I won't go through the ball. Again, the results speak for themselves. And for me, I think the overall results demonstrate how the team at Bel Air have embraced the challenge over the past 12 months. So, what of the current year <laughs> two, which we now have seven months into? Well, this year we've got to look forward to the relaunch of Cable Leisure Centre and completion of both the gym and the new pitch there. We're doing some minor remodelling work at the Leisure and Culture Park and Prescott Gym. We're looking at the refurbishment of the Cable Leisure Centre Gym to accompany the new poolside steam and sauna that we've recently fitted in there. And we're also, similar to Kirby, looking at the relaunch of the core offer of the Hayward Leisure Centre. However, we're also working on external consultants for the Dalton Hayward Leisure Centre. Hayward Leisure Centre is one of our biggest sites, and it's also one of our most challenging sites with regards to footfall. So, in collaboration with these consultants, we're looking for opportunities or potential commercial opportunities that are for Hayward in the future. We've recently recruited a handyman to reduce our overall maintenance cost and continue to achieve better value for money. And we're also, what well, we have developed, we haven't implemented it yet, an aquatic strategy to further increase the uptake of summer lessons, which have already increased by 15% over the last 12 months. We've reviewed our marketing strategy and operational standards, and again, reviewed the workforce development strategy. We're looking to draw down some funding from the Skills Growth Funds. We've taken, or we've taken, or we plan to take on uh, 10 people through the ILM programme, and we're also looking at a couple of apprenticeships <coughs> as well. And we're seeking to build new and effective partnerships with organisations whose objectives are in line with ours. And obviously, as per our agreed business plan last year, we need to ensure we have that continued growth of at least 2% to ensure we balance the weeks. So, in terms of the current and future risks and challenges, <coughs> politically and consumer uncertainty, the leisure pounds, and disposable income are very sensitive to the political and economic changes. Increased costs as a smaller organisation, we have not the same ability as perhaps bigger organisations, for instance as the council, to absorb those costs. So we have increased costs over a number of business areas within our business that can have impact and cause pressures. Increased funding pressures for commissioners and other potential partners. They have less money, therefore they may have less money to commission us, the provider, to do some work for them. And increased maintenance costs. We have a fantastic estate that you, as a council, have invested heavily in over the last decade. And believe you me, it's the envy of many up and down the country. But maintenance costs only go one way, and that goes up and they increase year on year as the building stock gets older. And we've also got the continued year on year reduction in our subsidy, or you want to call it our management fee. All the above of which could affect our ability to reinvest in the facilities and ultimately impact us achieving an overall aim, and that is achieving zero subsidy by the end of year five. In summary, overall, we've had a very strong year and a very positive beginning. Considerable benefits have already been achieved. And that's attributable to the dedication, hard work from all the team at Bollier, from the frontline staff all the way up to the board. Staff are now fully engaged and are more empowered than they ever have been. We've been successful in recruiting new high quality <coughs> staff, and that's because they've been, they've been attracted by the drive, enthusiasm, and passion of the team at Bollier. Low level maintenance jobs are being completed more quickly, the facilities are starting to look better than they ever before and complaints have significantly, significantly reduced. But let's not forget, all things being equal, there will be some considerable challenges and difficult challenges ahead if we are to achieve our ultimate goal of achieving zero subsidy by the end of the year five. Any questions? <coughs> Thank you, um, Mr. Schofield. Colleagues, yet yeah, once again, are there any questions for Mr. Schofield? If there are, can we keep them short and not lengthy statements? No? 
Okay, Kevin, thank you very much. You're welcome to stay or if you want to leave. But once again, colleagues, can we um, can we respond in the, in the usual way? Colleagues, moving on to item number six, parliamentary election results. The report of the retaining officer is attached to item six on the agenda for members' information. The members agree to note the report. Yeah. Item number seven, public health annual report 2016-17. Councillor Shelley Powell. Happy to move that report, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Powell. Councillor Chris O'Hare. Happy to second those recommendations, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor O'Hare. Colleagues, are there any questions or comments from members of the Council? Are those, if there are no amendments, can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour? All those against? Would anybody like to abstain? The motion is carried. Item number eight, annual reports, 2016-2017. Councillor Andy Moorhead. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Can I move down recommendations? Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Councillor Chris O'Hare. Happy to second those recommendations, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor O'Hare. Are there any questions or comments from members? Can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Would anybody like to abstain? The motion is carried. Item number nine, amendment to the scheme of members' allowances. Councillor Andy Moorhead. Thank you again, Mr Mayor. Can I move them recommendations? Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Councillor Chris O'Hare. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Happy to second those recommendations. Thank you, Councillor O'Hare. Again, colleagues, are there any comments from members of the Council? Can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour? All those against? Would anybody like to abstain? The motion is carried. Item number 10. Fire at the Remondus Waste Treatment Centre, Councillor Andy Moorhead, to move the recommendation. Can I move down the recommendations, Mr Mayor? Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Councillor Byron? Happy to second the recommendations, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Byron. Again, colleagues, any, any questions from members of the Council? Can I put the motion to the vote? Yes, Thank you, Mr Mayor. Can I uh, speak at the end of the debate for this? Um, sorry, Councillor Cashman. Yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. I think this report goes some of the way to making the administration eat a little bit of humble pie, if I'm uh, being honest on this issue. Uh, Mr Mayor, on the morning of this fire, I was contacted by countless residents informing me of the severity of this incident and the seriousness of their concerns. They told me not to allow this to be brushed under the carpet and this report goes some way to vindicating those residents concerns in stating that this should have been called a major incident from the start thank you thank you councillor cashman are there any other members that wish to um, comment councillor andy mohead thanks mr mayor um, some of you may today have heard uh, Councillor Cashman's interview on the radio on Radio Mercy <coughs> I listened with a great deal of interest and quite frankly it was astounded with some of the claims he made. He's just done it exactly the same again. But I'd like to take this opportunity to correct a number of the issues that Councillor Cashman has raised today and has been raised since the incident itself. The report is not rightly critical, as you've said in the audio interview today of council and other agencies. The report did in fact highlight the partnership working in an area of good practice. Whilst listening to the views of local residents is commendable by Councillor Cashman, declaring it's a big instance, it was meant for the emergency services and not for the councillor. The incident was managed professionally and effectively by the emergency services. Facts should have been established by Councillor Cashman before
for conveying his own views, which turned out to be not only incorrect, but also alarmist and completely unhelpful. His role as an elected member is provide accurate information and reassurance, when in fact his actions on the day only serve to put fear amongst the community he serves. The emergency service working with the Public Health England, the Environment Agency and others assess the situation and the evacuation procedures were not necessary. Councillor Cashman's announcement that this was an environmental disaster is quite at odds with the professional agencies who were managing this situation on the ground. Councillor Cashman states that this, his comments were seeking clarity on the situation. I keep completely, completely disagree with this. And that the clarity should have been so prior to Councillor Cashman's facilitating with media meeting. To say that the council did not accept that it was a big incident is again inaccurate. Our emergency duty officer was at the scene and liaising with all agencies to provide updates to members and the wider community. We convened a tactical coordinating group with key agencies, a process we managed over the coming days and weeks after the incident. Councillor Cashman indicated that he wanted to be involved in the multi-agency DB process to identify where lessons can be learned to improve any future multi-agency responses. When invited to comment, Councillor Cashman and his colleagues failed to provide any at all. He then went on to radio Merseyside to say that our requests were child's play stating that we are trying to quieten them and to make sure that they didn't have their say. Why then would be ensuring he was to be asked for his comments if that was the case? The claim made by Councillor Cashman that the council are regretting <coughs> not treating this incident more seriously is, is absolutely shambolic on our response was completely appropriate. We facilitated a tactical coordinating group to manage the recovery phase. We commissioned our own air quality tests. We coordinated all of the different agencies' key messages to ensure that there was one key source of information, which was accurate, consistent, and regularly updated. I'm glad that Councillor Cashman accepted the need to attend awareness training. To pick up on Councillor Cashman's point about the council needing awareness training around declaring a major incident on the day, the key responders were the police and the fire services, not the council. We completely understand the rationale for the police and the fire not declaring this a major incident. Road closures were being managed effectively and the fire was being tackled successfully. The prevailing weather conditions also meant that there was no need to evacuate the residents. Had there been a need to evacuate, then at that point a major incident may have been declared. We completely understand the criteria for a major incident and where it would be our decision to declare one. With regard to burning materials, the environment lazy has an immense materials as they regulate the environment permit on the site. To conclude, Councillor Cashman should object his facts first before simply relaying residents' concerns without facts to back up his claims. Health organisations have confirmed that there was no health risk to the residents, which would have been more helpful message for Councillor Cashman to convey. Finally, and I'm going to say this, I am true to my word when I did say that this approach would, would be open and transparent. Every step of the way has been to this council to be discussed, which is why I published this debrief report and included it in this item today on the council business. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Colleagues, are there any further questions members would like to ask? 
not, if there are no amendments, can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour? All those against? Would anybody like to abstain? The motion is carried. Item number 11, designation of the Council's statutory scrutiny officer and amendments to the Constitution. Councillor Chris O'Hare. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Happy to move those recommendations. Thank you, Councillor O'Hare. Councillor Murphy. Uh, Julie second those. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Colleagues, once again, are there any questions or comments from members of the Council? If there are no amendments, can I put the motion to the vote? All those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Would anybody like to abstain? The motion is carried. <coughs> Item number 12, joint authorities and combined authority. No questions have been received. <coughs> Item number 13, members question time. Mm -hmm. Councillor Edna Finneran, I believe you'd like to ask a question. Yes, please, Mr <coughs> Mayor. Can the leader tell me what steps the council are taking to improve the quality of our local environment? Thank you, Councillor Finneran. Councillor Andy Moorhead to acknowledge the question. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, thank you, Edna, for uh, Councillor Finneran for your question. Can I defer the, your question to Councillor O'Connor to respond on our behalf? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Councillor O'Connor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Finnan, for the question. Um, colleagues, as you all know, our new corporate plan includes the priority to create a sustainable borough. This includes our commitment to, develop, to developing a, and maintaining a high quality environment. Following years of austerity cuts forced upon us by the government and our, our priorities being directed into other vital services, we are now renewing our investment in improving the environment to, throughout the borough. In recent months, Labour members have agreed a substantial list of investments in our environment that will make a huge difference to the environmental standards in our community. At the time of reducing, budget, of reducing resources, this council has made, it, made sure that the investments into things that our residents see will be every day of the week. You will see the, the, what, what uh, quality is coming. These investments include a permanent investment of £300,000 per year in 17 additional posts in our street scene and ground maintenance teams. And I am pleased to inform members that all these officers are now <coughs> in post and working in our community. 150,000 for additional enforcement that will be targeted at the criminals who continue to flight it in our neighborhoods. 300,000 for more staff in our environmental sustainability service who will work with the residents to promote sustainability and behaviour changes to encourage residents to take care of their own neighbourhoods so that the council does not have to. A 290,000 investment into the Environmental Challenge Fund, fund excuse me, that will give all of our members money to spend with local community groups specifically to improve the environment in their neighbourhoods. This is a balanced series of investments that will make a, a change in the short, medium and long term. As well as an investment in place, this is an investment in our people and we will reap the dividends in the coming years. Colleagues, we have spent more than, we have committed more than one million pounds that we have chosen to invest. And that, that demonstrates to everyone our commitment to improving the environment in this borough. Thank you, Councillor Connor. We just remain in collecting for a moment. Um, Councillor Finneran, as the originator of the initial question, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Finneran. Thank you, Councillor Connor. <coughs> Thank 
Councillor Romara, I believe you'd like to ask a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can the leader inform us of the recent of the recent work which will help the social sector support the council's priorities? Thank you, Councillor Romara. Councillor Morehead. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Romara, for your question. Colleagues, for a while now, this council has adopted a set of cooperative principles to shape the way that we work both as officers and elected members. In our current corporate plan, these principles have been amended in order to describe the type of council we want to be and to outline how we want to work with our stakeholders. These stakeholders include our residents, our public sector partners, private businesses within the borough, and also groups and organisations in our social sector. The social sector includes everything from our small residents community groups right through to our big social enterprises. I have spoken to you before about how passionate I am about making sure that the money we have in this council stays within in the borough wherever possible. Labour in Nosley cannot abide companies taking profits out of Nosley and having that ship out, shipping labour to do work that could be best done by the people from Nosley itself. In our view, the best way that we can resolve this issue is to ensure that as much work as possible is delivered by our local groups and agencies. These groups are best placed to understand the needs of our communities and of our residents. And in my opinion, is that they offer the most social value when compared to other providers. Over the last year, I have been meeting with social sector leaders to ask them how we can work differently, to allow them to work better together with this council. They told me that we need to change the way we procure goods and services to make it easy for them to win contracts. So that is exactly what we have done. They told me that they wanted to co-produce solutions with the council <coughs> rather than simply reply to council specifications. A step change in the way we're going to do business. As such, we have made council commissions sit and listen to the sector so that they could build better relationships to help us work better together in the future. <coughs> they told me that they wanted me to make formal, a formal commitment to this new way of working. Over the last six months, council officers and Nosley Community Volunteer Services have been working on a document entitled Nosley Better Together. Tomorrow, after I make a keynote speech about Nosley Council's deal with the social sector, our new and improved relationship, and on our new and improved relationship, I will on behalf of this council formally sign this deal with our social sector partners. The social sector told me that reintroducing grants would help them play a bigger role. This Labour-run council <coughs> has established a £700,000 Nosley Better Together fund that will allow social sector organisations in Nosley to directly support the council five priorities in the coming years. These grants of up to £10,000 will be made available in the autumn, exclusively to community groups and organisations or based in or work largely in Mosley. Together with the 300,000 that Councillor Connors just mentioned in the Community Environmental Challenge, our Green Dividend Fund, this equates to £1 million that this council will directly invest into the social sector so that we can work to better together in the years to come. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Um, once again, um, Councillor Omara, as the originator of the <coughs> initial question, would you like to ask a supplementary question? No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Omara. <laughs> Councillor Cashman, I believe you'd like to ask a question. <coughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, does the leader think it is appropriate in these hard times to spend a quarter of a million pounds to take on highly paid staff when lower earners are losing their jobs? Thank you, Councillor Cashman. Councillor Moorhead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, uh, colleagues. We've just heard of Councillor uh, Eddie Connolly that we've just created seven senior jobs as well. <coughs> the ones that we're proposing. Anyway, but it never ceases to amaze me when our Conservative coalition Lib Democrat councillors mention our financial challenges. Time and again, they are happy to ask point scoring questions, big one tonight, I suppose, about what we are doing and why we are doing it. But they always forget to mention why we face the financing challenges that we do. So let's just remind ourselves of a bit of history. By 2020, <laughs> this council will have lost £100 million. The residents of Northley have lost more funding for public services than any other residents anywhere else in the country. And as we know, most these residents need the support of public services more than most. That is an almost <coughs> unbelievable state of affairs. So how could this have happened? Where did all this austerity come from? Well, let's remind ourselves. The National Austerity Programme started in 2010, when the Tories and the Liberal Democrats colluded to attack those in the most need and savage the public sector. And this is continuing to this day, even after the recent general election results, when all three Liberal Democratic candidates in North UDP lost their deposits. I'm sure that almost everybody in the chamber is looking forward to a day very, very soon when a caring government will be elected and we can go about helping our people again. And that government can only be Labour. As far as North is concerned, I'm just not going to take any lessons from Liberal Democrats about how to run this council. I spent some time at a recent meeting explaining how well we have been doing despite the cuts. We have turned the children's social care around and also social care around. We are delivering our growth plans faster than expected. We have managed to balance our budgets at the same time. And let's be clear about this. We are achieving great things to effective leadership. That includes not only the political leadership of this council, but also includes the hard work and professionalism of our senior officers, most of whom who are now working twice as hard as they used, used to, excuse me, thanks to the savage cuts inflicted on Nosey by the Liberal Democrats. It's no coincidence that we are doing a great job. It's because we invest in some of the best people around. And we have managed so far to do all of that without any support or positive suggestions from the Conservative opposition and Liberal Democrats, who, let's not forget, couldn't even be bothered to put forward a budget proposal this year. We know how to carry on doing a very good job. That is just what we intend to do. Councillor Cashman did not bother to attend a special governance meeting on Monday to discuss the proposed arrangements for senior officers. An opportunity for Councillor Cashman to put a rational counter-argument forward. One could say, but alas, he, he, he just wants to grandstand this evening at this council meeting to show uh, this is all show and no substance. Again, Councillor Cashman. At this meeting, I set out the reasons why we need additional expertise within this council. If he had been at that meeting on Monday, he would now understand why we need additional senior staff with expertise in health and social care and also in education. These posts reflect not only the ruling Labour Group's policy, but also the Council's policy that he and his colleagues actually voted for. Or is he now saying he does not want education to be improved in this budget? Is he now saying he doesn't want to care about the elderly or the infirm in this budget? Mr Mayor, if I may. Charles Kennedy, when he resigned as leader of the Lib Dems, said, and I quote, I have said that if people don't deliver, they go. I didn't deliver. He followed his own advice and went. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Mohit, if you kindly remain at the lectern. Once again, Councillor Cashman, as the originator of the initial question, would you like to ask a supplementary <coughs> question? Yes, please, Mr. Mayor. You don't tend to listen to rational arguments, Andy, so that one's out the window, isn't it? And we face these challenges because the council has actually increased its top earners. It seems to me that that's for the few 
and not the many. Uh, according to the Taxpayers Alliance, this council doubled the number of employees receiving over £100,000 just a few years ago. Do you think it is acceptable to continue that trend? And the council and Cashman, Council Mohead to respond? Yeah. I believe I'll give you the answer to your question. Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Once again, Councillor Cashman, I believe you'd like to ask a further question. Yes, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, can a leader confirm the residents of Cross Street and Greenwood Close will be housed in an area of their choosing if current plans by the Housing Trust are to go ahead? Thank you, Councillor Cashman. Councillor Moorhead. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, can I refer that question to Councillor uh, Bynoway, please, to answer my report? Thank you, Councillor Moorhead. Councillor Ryan O'Hare. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and can I thank Councillor Cashman for his question. Can I just remind everyone that back in May 2015, KHT Board were advised the results of a stock condition survey for flats in Cross Street were no longer fit for purpose or acceptable to Nosley residents in this day and age. The current accommodation fails to meet the Disability Discrimination Act and limits the improvements that can be made for those residents requiring adaptations. They are very small inside, tiny, and are not suitable for anyone in a wheelchair. The long-term view was to decant the properties, demolish them, and include them in the site of the Watch Factory Phase 2. Since Christmas, KHT have been meeting on a monthly basis with the residents who provide them with as much information as possible, and I am pleased to say that so far, 41 residents have been rehoused successfully. In answer to Mr. Carl's questions, Carl, question, Carl Cashman's question, I can confirm that residents have been given a pri band priority A rating. So that's under the allocations policy on property pool plus and as a result of their homes being in a due regeneration program. And residents will be able to bid on properties of their choice as they become available. I am aware that some people are not bidding on property pool at this present time and they are waiting to see if they have secured a place in the watch factory development phase one. KHT are about to send letters out to people who expect an interest in the watch factory development. But for those who live outside Nosley, they will not be allocated any properties. For those residents who are over the age of 55 and in receipt of commissioned care, these people will be offered a property, which I'm sure Councillor Cashman, along with the rest of us, will welcome. Unfortunately, the completion of phase one of the watch factory development has been delayed due to the building contractor working on the site going into liquidation. KHT are still in talk with the developer Iliad, which are hoping to complete soon so that the construction works can recommence and the residents of Cross Street and Greenwood Close will be kept updated. <coughs> As the lead member for housing in the borough, I am committed to both raising the borough's housing conditions and improving the residents with their choice and opportunities that they would expect. And this being delivered through the priorities identified in the Council's housing strategy, despite the austerity measures that have been impo imposed on this local authority and in the social housing sector by the government, including the, the then Conservative Alliance a couple of years ago. For our older residents, it's all about providing the right type of accommodation where they can maintain their independence, and at this time, include replacing properties that are no longer suitable. In partnership with housing associations across the borough, we are achieving this, and I am delighted that the Withens, a 12.4 million pound extra care facility, which will provide 64 apartments and 26 bungalows at Stockbridge Village, will be the first new homes built in <coughs> Stockbridge Village estate for 10 years. It is due to commence on site at the end of July. Thank you, Thank you Councillor O'Hare. If you'd really like to remain at the lectern. Once again, Councillor Cashman, if the originator of the initial question, would you like to ask a supplementary question? No, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, you Councillor O'Hare.
Item 14, Notices of Motion. Unison Campaign, Dignity and Social Care. Councillor Teddy Byron, I believe you, you have a motion that you wish the council to consider. Happy to move the motion, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Byron. Councillor Ros Smith, I believe you would like to second the motion. Yes, I'd like to formally second that notice of motion, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Byron, do you wish to speak on the motion? I do, Mr Mayor. Thank you. I am pleased to be moving this resolution today, especially as it is part of the Unison Campaign for Dignity in Social Care. On a personal level, I've been a member of Unison and its forerunner, Nalgo, for 45 years, so you can see what it means to me. Not forgetting that there's a real issue here, the future of social care in this country should be of concern to everyone. It should be a basic right that people who need social care should be treated with dignity and respect. And that goes hand in glove with the people who provide the social care who should also be given dignity and respect. To assist this, in this ambition, Unison in the North West have launched the campaign Co-Workers for Change, which aims to achieve improvements in care standards and employment practices for workers in residential and domiciliary care sectors. That is a target and is something we should all support. I believe central government should address the crisis in social care. This chronic underfunding of a service creates a failure to deliver proper standards and fails to, uh, to ensure that there are decent jobs and pay rates. Notably, council pays its staff the living wage and we should encourage all employers to do the same. At that point, I would like to pause for a second and just pass on information that I received from a Unison convener today. He told me that companies will not give union recognition and in doing so, they deny the opportunity to press the employer for better pay and conditions. Many companies deliberately cream off the money by, by short staffing. Not filling posts, they create extra work for those who are left on the shift. A bupa provider in Knowsley was alerted to the problem with a leaking ceiling recently. What they did was move the resident out and move someone else in. This particular person had no relatives in the area and therefore no one to complain. In the day-to-day -day business, there are last-minute changes to shift patterns, zero-hour contracts, and some pay no mileage when travelling from site to site. It is under these harsh conditions that Unison is looking to, for support from Nosley Council. As I said earlier, as a lifelong tradition of being a trade unionist and supporting the rights of staff to be in a trade union and support employment practice. This motion recognises the need to fund properly the social care sector, which in turn will benefit these people who rely on care. They do a fantastic job in our society and think anyone with a social conscience will automatically give their full support. I urge you to support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Byron. Councillor Smith, would you like to speak on the motion? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Are there any other members who would like to speak on the motion? Councillor Byron, before I put uh, um, the motion to the vote, would you like to respond? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Byron. On that basis, colleagues, all those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Would anybody like to abstain? The motion is carried. Yeah. Item number two. Gun crime and funding. Councillor Eddie Connor, I believe you have a motion you wish the council to consider. Can I make a motion, Mr. Mayor? Thank you, Councillor Connor. Councillor Murphy, I believe you'd like to second the motion. Duly seconded, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. <laughs> Councillor Connor, do you wish to speak on the motion? Please, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Connor. Merseyside has experienced a significant number of firearms <coughs> incidents that have directly, indirectly, indirectly or negatively impacted upon our residents and our communities. These incidents have created significant demand for our colleagues in Merseyside Police Force, as well as members of the wider Community Safety Partnership, 
who cl who collaborate who, whose collaboration that have been working to identify and bring to account the people responsible. Against this backdrop, excuse me, we have also nationally experienced a multi terror incidents, which have again placed additional demands on the multi partnership in order to ensure that they that there is an appropriate response that identifies those at risk of radicalisation and keeps our communities safe. In the face of these increased threats, however, services across the partnership continue to be, to be considerably impacted by the ongoing cuts and austerity. Enough is enough. It is unreasonable, unrealistic to expect the services to be able to respond in the appropriate in the appropriate manner in, the, in, to, in face of such considerable cuts. <coughs> As such, we call on the government to recognise these unprecedented demands that to stop the cuts and savings that Merseyside Police are required to, to deliver by 2020. In addition, we, all, we also call on the government to increase financial support to the wider partnership to enable the establishment of a local multi-agency prevention team to identify and challenge those at risk of engaging in or already engaged in serious organised crime. Again, the status quo is not good enough. We call on the government to recognise this and support us appropriately. I therefore ask colleagues to support the notion of motion on gun crime funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Connor. <coughs> Councillor Murphy, do you wish to speak on the motion? No, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Are there any other members who would wish to speak on the motion? <coughs> Councillor Connor, would you like to respond before the motion to the vote? No, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Connor. On that basis, all those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Would anybody like to abstain? The motion is carried. And finally, colleagues, item 15, any other items, seeing as there are no further items of an urgent nature, can I thank you all for your attendance here this evening? I now declare the meeting closed and wish you all a safe journey home. Thank you. Please be upstanding for the mayor.